Well, good morning, guys, and welcome to the show. Today, we have a fun one. Aren't they always fun, Fernando? They always fun. Yes. They're always fun. Always fun at five star. We have a Nissan Frontier. I don't know if we've ever done a video on one of these, so I thought it'd be a perfect time to do it. Let's take a look inside and see what we're gonna be doing, and then we'll take a look on the bench and see what it is we're gonna replace them with. So the Nissan Frontier has a complicated door panel to get off, only in the sense that this piece here is not that fun. You have to be super careful getting this off. Take this off first. We'll talk more about that later. Six by nine down here in the lower portion of the door, two and a half up in the top of the dash. Here is the factory radio. It is the solid piece across here. You do have to remove this whole thing to get it off. Does this one have a backup camera? Yes, it does. We'll be retaining the backup camera as well as the steering wheel controls. In the back door, it has a factory six and a half. It has these cool little cargo containers, one here and a bigger one there. They make a 210 box for it. For this one though, we're just gonna be doing a single 10. This is the box here. It comes with little feet that attach, these cool little rubber pieces and some screws to add those on. Comp RT 10 is gonna be going in there. There's that tray. So for the most part, this is what I'd consider just a basic upgrade from factory. Kind of like a Deccan 4, but the Deccan 5, 7. Deccan 7? For speakers, we'll go with the Kenwood KFC XP 6902s. This is a 6 by 9 inch mid-base with a 2 inch in the dash. They're 174, 6 and a half inch coaxles for the rear kit, wiring harnesses, steering wheel control is going to be done through the iData Alpine head unit and a Kenwood 5 channel amplifier. This is the regular Kenwood line. They've made this amplifier for a while. Uh, now it's been replaced by in the Exelon by the 8205. However, they kept this amp in the line because it was also the Marine amplifier, which was the 8005. This is an 801.5, so they still have some of these left, but they are going to be replaced by that form factor that the 8205 is in. We'll be putting this guy in probably underneath one of the seats. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Are you ready, Fernando? Where are you planning on starting? On the speakers. Cool. Yeah. While he gets the door panel off, let's head over to the bench. We'll unbox them and show you what is inside and what is in store. KFC XP 6902Cs. These are an awesome set of speakers because aside from just sounding great, they come with tons of mounting options for you. The first thing in the box is going to be the warranty and installation card with all the technical information on it. Bag of foam. This is a fast ring style piece of foam that is designed to go around the outside of the speaker to help it couple with the door panel. These are two universal brackets that are designed to do a whole bunch of cars. Some of them are listed here on the back. Toyota, 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 Chevy, Chevy. Dodge. And how you do that is you see all these little lines here. They're made to just break apart. This is like a GM clip here. This is another GM clip here. This fat piece here in the top and bottom are for Toyota. So you just disassemble these, mount them up to the door. And this bag of foam here is for going on the back of this as well as the front of it so when you screw the speaker in. This comes with a ton of foam. Here's another piece of foam, more foam. Underneath the speaker is a quarter inch spacer. This is good for Dodge to bring the speaker out if need be. They don't need them. I'll tell you that right now. These fit perfect in the Dodge. Let's take a closer look at the mid-base. It's a mid-base, meaning there's no tweeter on the inside of it. it. has the inverted cone here. Rubber surround. This is a mica based cone of some kind. Stamp steel basket. Now in the back you see these giant things here. This is the crossover for it. Now I know what some of you might say is, oh man the crossover is built into it. I'm going to run it active. It's okay. On the bottom here it says buy bypass and low pass. If you're going to be running on a system where it is going to be active, like a Dodge that has a premium audio system in it, you'd run it on the bypass. Or if you're going to hook it up to an amplifier that has a bandpass crossover and you're going to do a full active system, they've made it so you don't have to remove these or anything and just connect to these two terminals. Now, if you're going to be running it passive like we are in this system, you're going to connect it to the one that says low pass and the solid negative terminal over here. Looking at the factory speaker we are going to replace, this is a cloth surround, plastic cone. This is a wizard cup. This is to try to capture some high frequencies. To get this out of here, these are four eight millimeter screws. If 
you've seen us replace factory speakers before, you'll notice on most of them there is some kind of a foam on this. The reason this doesn't have it is there's actually a capture cone in the door panel itself that is designed to slide over the front of these. In some cases, you do have to remove that because the front of your new speaker is bigger, in which case you'd want to make sure to use the foam that it comes with to recreate that cup. Looking at this, you can see a tiny magnet when compared to our new Kenwood. This is going to give us the increased power handling. However, one of the things when using a smaller magnet like this is you do get pretty good bass response out of a factory speaker because the suspension is so loose. This is also a two ohm speaker. We're replacing the factory radio. That isn't going to be a problem, but if you were just going to do a speaker swap, you would notice a significant decrease in your sound level because one, you're going to a bigger magnet, which is harder to drive. And two, this is a four ohm driver, not a two ohm driver. So this isn't going to put the load on that radio to draw more power out of it. So this would be a much quieter speaker on that factory unit. You might be disappointed, but we're adding an amp. It's all good. Stamp steel basket, stamp steel basket. Really it's in the motor structure where the difference is between these two when comparing the height. Believe it or not, the factory is like a 16th of an inch taller than the Kenwood. This is what makes this speaker so awesome is it does have awesome bass response, but it's super shallow and fit in a lot of locations that your conventional six by nines won't. Because this does have such a small magnet, this bracket has this little piece here that sometimes your six by nine will not fit in. It also has these little pins that you can see right there for the factory speaker and those need to be removed. Test fit our six by nine into it and it actually fits perfect because it is a little bit shallower than the factory. So we don't have to modify this bracket any. We just need to get that foam onto here. I'm gonna set this over on Fernando's bench along with that foam so he can screw this together and get it back in the door. Let's take a look at what else is in the box. Up here at the top, you'll find the two passive crossovers for the speakers. These do need to be installed unless you're doing an active system. This is to provide these two and a half inch drivers here with the high pass filter they're looking for. Don't play these without these because you'll blow them. It's a two and a half inch driver. It's not made to handle full bandwidth. Two of these in the box, obviously two of these in the box. We also have a small bag here with some pigtails, bag with various screws, depending on what you're planning on doing. And then another little bag of foam. I'm guessing this foam is either for the basket and this. One of the foams is designed to wrap around the crossover in case it is going to rattle in the dash. And then there's nothing below this. Let's take a closer look at this and compare it to our factory speaker. This driver is a little bit unique in the line. It has this grill over it that is not removable, so don't try. It has these two little U-shaped brackets here in the end. I believe this was designed more for a Toyota than anything else. It is going to fit this Nissan on the back side. Pretty decent size magnet, 4 ohm. Your slide on terminals are located over here on the one end. The cone is a treated cloth cone with a material surround, so it's not butyl rubber. Looking at the factory speaker, paper cone, cloth surround. Looking at the magnets like the 6x9, this is a much smaller magnet. This is a 4 ohm driver though, which is good news because if you did need to replace this, this is sold separately as just a C2 with perform perfectly up in the dash of this. You'll notice this has a crossover located on it here. You don't need to retain this. However, you can remove this screw here and retain this clip, which I do recommend doing because you don't have to get up in the dash with crimpers or soldering or anything like that. You can just plug it back in and do all that wiring here on the bench, which we'll show you what that looks like before we slide these into place. Do a corner to corner test and this loop here does stick out. However, where it needs to screw in will screw in. These are made out of plastic. They are made to be cut to fit in, which once we get into the dash, we may have to do, but that's okay. Use two of the three screws in order to screw this in. In the meantime, I'm going to get these over to Fernando so that he can get that foam on the back and get those crossovers soldered up. Okay. Go for it. You good? The first panel that we're going to remove is the door switch. So grab a pry tool. Carefully start from the bottom. And the second one, and this is very important, that's the reason why you remove the door switches first, is because this one covering the door handle is so sensitive, This you have to pop it from the inside.
So as you see, this one has little tabs. You don't want to break those. Then pull the handle. Then this one. It's a 10 millimeter behind the handle. Next, remove the handle. I always start from the bottom and then just kind of pop up. It has so many clips. Behind that we have two 10 millimeters. Then grab a big pry tool. Start working your way around. And that's it. To remove the door speakers, it's the same thing, four 10 millimeters. Next up is the dash speaker. Grab your pry tool, start from one of the corners. Now this one has a rubber band that you have to pull it out. This one has three seven millimeters. Grab your pry tool. And that's just one clip. And you just repeat the process on the driver's side. To retain the factory bracket off of this two inch mid-range to make installation a lot safer, remove the screw. And there is some glue that's gonna be holding this in. And there's glue also holding this onto here. Snip off the wire as close to the ends as possible. That way if you ever need to put this back in, you can solder this back on. Take those same cutters and work your way across the side here. This is to remove the glue so that we can get this metal piece off. Once it's off, screw it back onto the speaker. You can set this aside, we're done with it. This is a red and black and the red is positive, the black is negative. Grabbing our new Kenwood crossover, on one end it has speaker terminals. The positive is solid black, the negative is the striped wire. I'm going to retain this staggered offset that this has line them up, cut them. I like to use eighth inch heat shrink for this, two to one shrink, slide it over my wires. Twist the two wires together and get it nice and tight. Don't have any little burrs or frays sticking off. Soldering gun is nice and hot and prepped and ready to go. Before you do anything with the soldering gun, make sure you clean the tip. With that all shined up, set the soldering gun underneath the wire and let it pull the solder into your twist might take a second don't camp out on the wire you don't want to shrink back any of this covering you also don't want to melt the harness repeat on the positive side it's very important to make sure you don't have any of those stray wire sticking up because if you do those can poke through the heat shrink and that could potentially cause a short. If you do, have your flush cutters, cause it's gonna happen at some point, no one's perfect all the time, and make sure to trim those off. This is all set now. You can leave it like this. I, however, prefer to wrap it with some Tessa tape. It's gonna be up in the dash where the sun is going to get to it. For that, I'll be using the exterior Tessa tape, which handles more heat. Wrap and pull as you're wrapping. You don't want this stuff to be loose. At the end, leave enough to wrap around like two or three times because it sticks best to itself. You'll end up with that and you can do the same to the other side. This gives it a nice finished look. Now if you want to be really particular, this is going to be for the driver's side. You could put a little white piece of heat shrink over it. This is a three to one so it will shrink down over this. This will also keep that tape from unraveling. And we end up with this. Easily going to plug in. We can put our speaker back up in the dash. Fernando's getting ready to put the new Kenwood in the door and he's asked me if I could real quick test to see which wire here is positive and negative. For that, I have my PT9A+, Plus. turn it on. Two leads into the end, I can hear that popping sound. I don't need to flip it over, I can measure it from the back. I wanna see a red. 
I'm seeing a green. Flip my terminals. I want to see red. The reason why I want to see the red, we're measuring the back side of the driver. So if I have red on the back side, I'll have green on the front side. That means that my white is positive, my blue is negative. We like to bend the negative down. This is going to be the same terminal throughout the car. So once we've figured out one, we don't have to do this again. Now that we know which one is positive and which one is negative, put the connectors and screw the speaker on. One of the reasons why we like to solder that clip on, as you can see, it's really tight up in there. I mean, just getting that speaker out is a pain. And you see how short that wire is. That means it's really nice to just be able to plug it in, slide it into place. You don't want to break the windshield or scratch the top of the dash. We were talking about how these, how the little arms, these little guys here, were going to be too long. They're made out of plastic, so they are made to be trimmed up. As you can see, this area has a slight rise to it, which is getting in the way. We'll trim those down slowly and make a few cuts to get it just right and we'll get this screwed in. Well, that one's good. No, that's good. Okay. So you can see it's trimmed off a little bit on each side, the same amount, which has allowed us to get it in there. If you look really close, you can see that gray foam that he put on the back of it that was in the box. With the screws in, the last thing to do is test fit it to make sure it fits. And of course, getting that rubber band clipped back into place. Perfect. With the passenger side all done, we'll move on to the driver's side, get all those speakers in, and then we'll get the back doors off. While he's finishing that up, let's head over to the bench and take a look at the six and a half we're gonna put in, and of course, compare them to the factory ones we're taking out. For the rear speakers, you're going to repeat the process as the front star on the window switch panel with your pry tool. Second part is cover on the door handle. Like we said, this is very important so you don't break the clips. And then the third, Sometimes these ones are a little bit hotter, but they come off. Remove the three 10 millimeters, and then grab your pry tool, plastic, prefer. Start from the bottom around, and that's it. For the speakers, same thing, three 10 millimeters. Now in this one, we don't have to remove the whole bracket. Let's take it to the bench. Let's take a look at the rear speakers we're putting in, the KFC X174s. Just like their big brothers, they have these cool brackets here that are designed to allow you to put these speakers in a multitude of different vehicles. Just like the other brackets, they have these cool little break points in them so you can break them down. The main ring itself, a lot of people don't realize, is actually a spacer. So if you just need a quarter inch spacer, if you break everything off, it creates one for you. These speakers do come with grills if you're doing an installation where you need those. And how you would do that is the mesh does pop off, put the speakers in, and then you can stick the mesh back on. The driver itself is made out of the same materials that the six by nine is made out of. They're made to go together. We have a butyl rubber surround, that mica plastic base cone, giant cloth dome tweeter in the top. I mean, this thing is huge for a coaxial. Decent sized magnet on the back, stamp steel frame. These are capable of being bi-amped. If you'll notice right here, the tweeter wire does come out and there is a capacitor for the tweeter right here. If you're going to be doing a full active system, you can remove this and attach your amplifier just to the tweeter itself. Otherwise, it is soldered into place to be used as a passive system. Inside the box, there is also a little piece of butyl. This is for attaching the grill back together if it's gonna be hanging or if it's gonna be in a place where it may fall off. A bag of screws and also some pigtails with ends on them to lengthen the factory wiring if need be. Let's take a closer look at these compared to the factory speaker. Take a closer look there again, small magnet, two ohm, just like the front mid base, but it has this weird construction to it, this whole big plastic thing that moves the speaker out an inch or more foam on the back, nothing on the front because it has the lip that goes over it, has the wizard cone, treated plastic mica resin 
type material here along with a cloth surround. Looking at the back, the speakers, just like the six by nines in the front, small magnet, decent bass response output, two ohm, gonna really put a load on that factory radio. Bigger magnet, gonna need more power, four ohm. This is not gonna be a good matchup unless you're doing what we're doing, which is adding an amplifier, which of course, not that these sound good, these sounds like crap. To make this speaker fit the same way this does, we're gonna need a bracket. For this, we'll be using the Pack Audio NSB710. It's just a Nissan adapter. Pack makes them, Metro makes them, and it is designed to have that same whole configuration that the factory does, so you can bolt that right into place. It's also thick and moves the speaker out just enough to where this will sit in the same spot. If you notice, it has these these things here. For some reason they think somebody might put a five and a quarter in here so they leave those on there but our six and a half will fit just fine. Some six and a halves, you will need to break these off in order to get them in there. Make sure you put foam here on the front and on the back before putting it into place. For that on the back side we have a quarter inch 16th inch foam that we buy and you can find on DNF tool drawer, which is where we put all of the cool things that we use in our installation if you'd like to get yourself a roll. Once you get that on the back, we switch to a half inch thick for the front. I'll get this over to Fernando so he can get it into the car. We have our speaker prepped, we put a pigtail. The reason why is because the factory wire doesn't go as the front one from the inside. We put the bullet connectors and we put red heat shrink and black heat shrink to identify which one is positive and which one is negative. Now we can put the door back. Now even though we've gone online and checked harnesses and dash kits and all those fun things. And I'm pretty sure we have all the right parts. I still don't like to build anything until I get this radio out, just double check. Because sometimes they're different. And in a Nissan, they're almost always different. Nissan is one of the hardest of the cars to make sure you have all the right pieces that do what they're supposed to do. To get this out, we start here at the top. I like to use this metal pry tool here to kind of get up my first corner. I also like to just go through and clean out the seams. Just kind of gently pressing on it. These suck, I'm not gonna lie. These are really easy to break. Nissans have always been easy to break. Go slow, and kind of work your way through. The clips are located about an inch in and then about a half inch from the back. That is the area you want to try to pry. Don't try to pry on the front or across the back. That's why this metal tool works so well because it is so thin and it can get in there next to those clips. And that's these guys here. One, two, three, four. And there's one here in the front. Inside the radio, there's a Phillips here and a Phillips here that is holding the physical radio in. And then there's one screw located in the very center holding the plastic in. They are all, all one piece. This whole big piece is all connected. We're gonna pull this out. Then we're gonna remove the airbag light bulb off of the kit and plug it back in. If you pull this out and leave it unplugged and you accidentally turn the car on, you're gonna get an airbag light because the circuit isn't complete. Grab it here at the top on both sides and gently, gently work it a little bit. Now the radio just fell out, which it isn't supposed to do, which leads me to believe somebody has had this apart in the past. Yes, this should all be one piece and it is missing the screws. So somebody has been playing around inside of here. Pull it out as much as it'll come. Two clips on the air conditioner, the one for the airbag, and then the last one for the hazard switch. The radio is supposed to be screwed into these four pieces here and all come out as one piece. To get that airbag out, it uses a small Torx. Click it back in. All right. Let's see what's going on here. There's a ton of little plugs located on the back of this radio. And there's always one that is gonna be a pain in the butt. In this case, it is our satellite antenna. Some of the things that we're gonna to have to retain with this is the factory USB, which is located down here. This is just a GM USB one, I believe is what it's called. There's these giant harness here 
this is gonna have in some cases our steering wheel controls but in all cases our backup camera and reverse trigger are gonna be in this harness this is the main wiring harness which is smaller of the two big white harnesses if you're gonna do this get two of these which I'll show you why and then there's this little guy right here this little eight pin this is for the aux input which will not be retaining the antenna in this case it's just one wire going into it you want to check if it's one or two if it's two the second one is for the amplifier for it. Usually in cars, not all that much in trucks. SUVs also will have that. And then this magenta one that was a pain is your Sirius XM antenna. This piece right here is just a plastic thing that just gets in the way. I like to remove it. When I put the dash all back in, all my wiring will go in easily enough. For that, we have one of these little floorboard trimmer pieces. And now we have full accessibility, put all our aftermarket stuff into the car. Let's head over to the bench. We'll take a look at the harnesses that we have, our steering wheel control interface, and the dash kit itself. The radio we're gonna be going with is the Alpine ILX W650. It's definitely the workhorse in Alpine's lineup. Comes in at a really good price point and it has wired CarPlay, wired Android Auto, and a pretty decent audio pack built into it as well, which is really what we're looking for when designing a system. There's one big bag inside of the box, and inside that bag it comes with a USB extension. One end has this cool 90 that's designed to plug into the back of the radio. Bluetooth mic, the main power harness, and then the RCA harness, and a bag of screws. All the plugs on the back of these Alpine radios are detached. The radio comes in a bag, wrapped in plastic and then in typical Alpine fashion it has a cool screen protector on it you can see the little tongue for it right here really like that another thing that makes this radio honestly kind of a blessing to put in right now is you see this quarter inch right here where the screen comes out most radio manufacturers are doing away with this however most kit manufacturers haven't adopted this process yet and this will still look good in all the kits that need that extra length some of these are as little as sixteenth of an inch and it kind of looks bad in a lot of cars. On the back of the radio, this is what's called a short chassis. As you can see, it's very tiny. The only thing sticking off it is the antenna adapter with the little six inch pigtail. Really nice feature. I prefer this as opposed to something in the board. It just makes things a little bit easier when putting it on the dash. The big USB in the back. One thing to note is that you'd think it would go like this. It doesn't because the preamp is right below it. This plugs into the top and goes like that. You'll notice this notch here, this notch here. This is for the add-on amplifier that they make to go onto the back of this to make it a full DIN, but get a giant 50 watt or a 200 watt sub-amp that you can attach to it. The Bluetooth microphone is red. The wired remote is a black input here. They're both the eighth inch or 3.5 millimeter style inputs, but they're color coded and it's in big print on the top of the radio right here. You can add a Sirius XM adapter to it if that's something you want. Main power harness and the RCA preamp is located here on the bottom. Um, on the RCA preamp cable, there is a front camera input and a rear camera input. So this has dual camera capability. And then it has the staggered styled RCAs that Alpine is known for. You have the sub, which is this blue trim here. And you'll notice there's two white ends. It's a mono output. It's two white ends. It's not a left and right. Pick whichever one you want. If need be, you do not need to use a Y jack if your amplifier only has one input. The next one up is going to be front, which is gray. And then the long one purple is going to be your rear we'll get into detail on the powering harness when we go to wire it up to our interface for the the harness we're going to use is a BHA 7552 or a 70 7552 if you go to Metra. It has a black ground, a yellow power, an orange illumination, a red accessory 12 volts. There is a blue amplifier turn on or amplified antenna turn on depending on the car. And your eight speaker wires in four pairs, the white driver, the gray passenger, the green driver's rear, and the purple passenger rear. Solids are positive, stripes are negative. But what's missing from this harness is the three steering wheel control wires that are typically going to be in here. That is why I recommend buying two of these so that you can remove those three wires and pin them into this as opposed to cutting into the factory harness. You don't need a fancy pin tool to remove these. Really, you need a razor blade. As you can see here, these three cuts to remove these wires because this is really a pain in the butt to depin. 
when you cut the little notches under these, these will just pull out. Now, as I said, you need three. This has that amplifier turn on that may not be in the car, and this could be your third one. I'm gonna plug this into the car real quick and check. Now to do that, just simply plug this in, look at this pin location, look at it on the other side. If there's a wire there, obviously you're gonna need to keep it. But in our case, there wasn't a wire there. I can remove this and use it. Cut a slight slit, slide it right out. Now we have the three wires that we're gonna need for our steering wheel controls. I haven't showed you them yet, so don't feel like you've missed something. Let's figure out what those are gonna be. To get that information, because we're using the Maestro SW, it is going to be in the software we use to flash this. Opening the box, we have the little steering wheel control interface. It shows you where to go to download the software to your laptop, both Windows or Mac. It comes with the USB flashing dongle, the pigtail to go into the back of the radio. There are two Two wires on it, a blue with a yellow stripe, which is for Kenwood and JVC, and the eighth inch style, which is for basically everybody else. The harness here has little teeth that you can pry up. You don't have to break anything, cut anything, and you can slide out that blue yellow wire, put it back in the box if you like. The blue will plug into the blue connector here, just like this. The second harness is gonna be for power and to hook up to these wires. And there's a bunch of wires on here. It has very similar plug as the blue. So if there will be a couple wires we won't need. We can remove them. If you already downloaded WebLink, launch it. If not, do that first. Plug in your connector. In this case, my computer has a USB-C. So I have a USB-C adapter for it. Plug the brain in. You will need the year, make, and model of the vehicle to do this, as well as you need to know what type of radio you're using. This is a 2018 Nissan Frontier and it has the five inch color display. They're gonna show you what the steering wheel controls look like. If they match up, select next, ILX W650. The nice thing about the iData connection is we can now go in and program our steering wheel control buttons to do anything we want simply by clicking on it and choosing from our drop down menu. This is the flash page. This will go over and make sure that all your information that you've chosen is correct. And if it is, select flash. It'll take a second. It'll upload that information to our steering wheel control interface and then select download install guide. It's not actually gonna download it, it's just gonna open it up in the computer from your desktop. On this, it'll show you the year, make, and model of the vehicle along with all the information that you just fed it. It'll give you a schematic of the unit itself. The reason why this is helpful is that if you do decide to do any depinning and you keep the wires, this will tell you where those go if you need to put them back in. As we scroll down, it tells us the wires that we're going to be using, which is the purple red, the pink red and the black white. You'll also be using the accessory and ground. So we'll be using five wires to do this installation. And then it will show you a picture of the radio connection. Over here, it tells you the connector, which is A, there's only one connector, and then the pin out of where those are located. In this case, we will be using 16, six, and 15. So 16 and 15 are located next to one another on the bottom of the plug, and six is located right above 15. It also tells us the colors of wire. There's a light green, a violet, and an orange that our wires will be connected to. Now we have three wires here, and naturally I chose these three wires for a specific reason. The blue white I'm going to use for my black white wire on here which is ground and then I have a light green which is purple red and then a pink red. Those will be the green and the green black. I don't like to look at this and try to figure out here on the bench. I want to find that first wire which is pin six, which is gonna be violet, because once I know that, I'll be able to move forward. Now, most of the time in the Nissan, that pin six is located right here next to the red wire. So that's a good place to start. Make sure that that is pin six, in fact. Well, this is one of those instances where the information that we have for color doesn't match the colors that are in the harness. That's not to say that they aren't the right wires, they just might have the wrong colors. In that case, you want to make sure you just use the pin configuration for the install because the pins are gonna be the same no matter what the color is. So we'll add in pin six. Pin 15 is located right beneath it. Make sure when putting these pins in to check the opposite side, this side, when you're pushing the wire through, especially on this plug, it has a habit of going into the wrong hole. And then located next to that, be this. 
To verify that those three wires, because the colors weren't right, I decided to do a twist and tape. A twist and tape is simply that. I twist the wires together, I put some tape over them so I can plug everything in to verify functionality. Our radio is sitting right here. If I come over and I work the volume control and I look at the radio, I can see that it is working the volume. Test other buttons like mode just to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do and in this case they are that means those three wire positions were correct even though the color was wrong now we can move on to our next line round of testing which is this harness which is going to be our backup camera and reverse trigger metro makes this harness here which is the axbucs dash ni 326 v it's a lot of harness numbers and a lot of the times when dealing with nissan you just try to find something that will plug in if it actually works that's a bonus but you can always repin it to get it to do what you want in this case there is wiring on the other side where the camera should be and it is their standard wire colors factory cameras are going to use six volts they're not a 12 volt and they give you this little 12 to 6 volt adapter make sure to use it don't try to power up the factory your camera without it or you will be replacing the factory camera there's a blue red wire and that goes to the red wire in this harness that is for the backup camera and then it'll say on this little flag right here camera power six volts there's a second red wire in this harness which is for the steering wheel adapter the leftover end is a blue white and a black those are going to need power for this we're going to use our cctv tester it has a 12 volt output you can use the 12 volts that are on this plug that you had to power this up and you can use the radio that you're going to put in as the tester if you want in this case we like to test it by hand first and we could see here we have a functioning camera we can also see that it it is a some kind of a handle cam it's mounted off center which is not the end of the world it's just the, the, they have to be made aware that when retaining factory cameras sometimes they are not going to be in the same place they were on the factory screen because the factory screen will actually crop and move the image anytime you go to replace a radio and there is a factory cam you can look in the back the camera is not dead center chances are good it's going to be off on your aftermarket screen to the left or to the right depending on where the camera is positioned if the camera has adjustable backup lines on it you can then use those to center the camera back up so that it is straight according to those lines also on this harness we have this green purple wire here this should be our backup wire and to test that we have a digital multimeter one end to ground put it in reverse you get voltage in this case we got 11.8 volt put it in the neutral and it goes away that's telling us that this in fact is the reverse trigger there's a lot of testing that has to be done on one of these nissans and that is why we plug that airbag wire back in because we have to turn the this on several times during this installation. I'll meet you over at the bench where we'll dress this harness up and remove any excess wiring we don't need and also connect up that 12 volt to 6 volt adapter. Now the task is to blend all of this stuff together. And I like to do that by removing as much of it that I don't need as possible. We'll start with the backup camera harness. Remove all of the tape. This has a pink and a pink blue. These are data wires that aren't needed. This would be for specific steering wheel control applications. This not being one of them we simply just pull on these and they will come out next is this giant ground bundle here remove the heat shrink and there is one ground that comes off all by itself remove all of those excess ground wires and then this whole thing will just come off you throw it in the trash place the shrink wrap that you just removed grab the 12 to 6 volt adapter first wire we're going to hook up is the blue red which is our 6 volt output to our red wire Twist the wires nice and tight, like before. Make sure there's no wire sticking out from underneath. And that's it. Let the heat pull the solder into the wire. For wiring up a harness, there's a combination of tape, no tape. In this case, we're gonna start with isolating this out to itself. Keep in mind that this is gonna be plugging into the back of the radio, so this harness doesn't need to be all that long. Starting at the plug side, what we're making is a T of just the power wires. Cut them all to length. I like to put a little piece of heat shrink over that end there. Add in a couple zip ties at the end down here towards the base where the camera wire is. Not too many, just enough to kind of hold everything in place. So I'll just be using two. I want this wire to float because it's going to go off on its own. 
and not be part of this. That is a finished cable. And what it's comprised of is two ground wires, the reverse trigger, which is this green purple, and the blue white, not to be confused with an amplifier turn on. It is going to be an accessory. So that will hook up to our red wire out of our factory harness. We just want it to have power when the key is on. Moving over here to the factory harness, pull off all the twisting tape that we did, grab our iData connection. You can cut this to length as much or as little as you want. I'm gonna want this to kind of sit down low in the dash out of the way. Keep in mind that this is gonna plug in the back of the radio. You don't have to go too crazy on this. Using the same exterior Tessa tape, bundle this all together. Two of our main harnesses ready to go. I can attach the accessory wires from the two of them together along with the ground wires. In some Nissans, this black wire, there's nothing there. And you'll need a ground wire. In some cases, it is a low voltage wire. In either case, for our installation, we're gonna need to remove the factory brackets off of this radio, which is gonna add an extra ground plane to the radio. So we don't need to worry about that particular thing. But if you are worried or concerned, add in a secondary ground wire to this that you can take off to that big bar behind the radio. Some dash kits are all plastic, in which case, I do recommend doing a secondary ground coming off of this black wire. This I've already got built. I'm gonna add in my main harness, soldering in the ground in the accessory, as well as the three wires that I've added to go to the steering wheel control over here. With those three wires connected, soldered, and insulated, on the Nissan plug, there is an orange wire. This orange wire is illumination. We are using an Alpine. An Alpine does not have an illumination wire, even though on it, there is this giant orange wire coming off of it. The orange wire is for backup or reverse trigger on this radio. So we need to cap this off or remove it. I like to just cap that one off. On the Alpine harness, you have the eight speaker wires, which are identical to the colors we mentioned earlier. We have a blue with a white stripe, which is the amplifier turn on. You have a blue wire, which is the amplified antenna turn on. There is a yellow with a blue stripe, which is the parking brake wire. The orange that we just talked about is reverse trigger, a yellow constant 12 volts, a black ground, and a red accessory. And they all have different lengths and they're all kind of goofy. What I like to do is stretch out all of them except for my constant 12 volts because it has a big fuse on it to the same length that of the remote turn on wires and cut them all to length if you need longer reverse trigger or parking brake keep those out first wire i like to deal with is the ground then the red accessory wire the next wire I want to work with is the orange white to my green purple. Once the solder cooled down, you can add on the heat shrink. Don't do it until the solder has cooled though, especially on the ground where you have all those wires. That's gonna be a really a hot bundle and you don't want to shrink the heat shrink prematurely. For this, we'll be running speed wire up into the dash, which is a nine conductor wire, and it is gonna connect on this end here. I like to run my remote turn on wire all the way through the harness and have it meet up with this as opposed to have it separate. That way it can hook up to that nine conductor wire. That leaves the speaker wires that we're gonna just cap off because we're not using, and the constant 12 volt wire. I'm gonna shorten that up just a little bit. It's still gonna stay long. I'm gonna take this off as a pigtail off to the side. And just like that, all our connections are made. I have these pulled off to the side. They'll go off in their own little bundle. Straighten these out as much as you can, and we will tape up the harness. We're not gonna cover up the solder points. We're gonna put a different type of tape over those. We wanna be able to get to those if we ever need to. And if we tape up the whole harness, we have to pull half of the tape back to get to it. The harness is all set and done. Let's go through it real quick. The backup camera retention is located here. The main power is here. Steering wheel control. This will plug into this extension cable here, so this will be long enough. Thank you to Alpine. Steering wheel control will plug into the back of the radio. Power harness. The wires coming off of the harness, the speaker wires are all insulated and capped off. These wires are gonna be what our amplifier are going to connect to. And this guy is all set and ready to get into the car. The last piece of 
the harness puzzle is this, which is the antenna adapter, which is the BAA36. It has this little blue wire here. Initially looking at the radio, we saw that it did not have this turn on. This just pulls out, and now this is all set and ready to go into the car. Because it's a standalone simple thing like this, and we still have some work to do on the radio, do yourself a favor, go plug it into the car right now. To install this radio, we're gonna be using the pack NDK 780. This is for 2012 to 2018 Nissan. To do this kit, according to the instructions on the back here that we can see through the bag, we're gonna need the brackets off of the factory radio. To get those off, it is a Torx machine thread screw, which is perfect because we're gonna need that same screw to screw into the Alpine. I like to use a regular screwdriver to get these off, just because sometimes these are really screwed in and you don't wanna strip them using a drill. One of the things we found out while we were working on this is that they did try to install an aftermarket radio. That's why this wasn't screwed in properly. And they've went ahead and put an R on it, meaning right. They got it wrong, but they still marked this right. With the brackets off, you can set this aside and grab our Alpine radio. Inside the bag, obviously the instructions are there. But there's these two little pieces like this, which are going to allow us to attach this to the brackets and then the big screen piece here. And like I was talking about earlier, as you can see when I put this on, you know, it has, it's, it's countersunk in there pretty far. It's like a quarter of an inch. So when I use the Alpine screen, it sticks up into this bracket, which is nice because all these buttons are across the bottom here. If it was a newer radio, it would sit in there very far and maybe not look as good. That is the way of the new world. If you get one of the motorized screens, those stick out far. It's the new mechalist radios that can cause you grief. These brackets here are designed to snap into place. However, sometimes, the holes that they are designed to snap into, they didn't do a really good job of cleaning the press last time. You may have to go in there with a razor knife and cut out the excess that is in there. All right, so after playing with this for far too long, we have these attached to it, which will go over the radio just like this. And there is a left and right on the side, so make sure you get that right. All right, with a little bit of fussing around, check to make sure that everything is seated properly. And if it is, this should be all part of the same piece. Next, I wanna bring back the big dash bezel because this is supposed to be attached to that. Now they've removed all the screws and they're missing, of course, so we'll have to find some new screws. But this should line up and naturally it doesn't line up the way I was hoping. We'll go back at it and see if we can get it to work the way it's supposed to. When doing kits, it is, you know, because they are universal and they fit multiple cars, they don't always get it right for every single application. Sometimes they do. On the back of these, they have these little nubs that stick up. These two closest to the radio need to be sanded out of the way. Now, if you don't want to use this type of kit with these type of brackets, Metra does make a kit that has all of this all built in, so you don't have to use these brackets. Both of them in the end will get you to where you want to be, a radio on the dash. Sometimes when you're doing what you think is gonna be the most easy thing in the world, it immediately turns into something that is not. When you're using factory brackets, guaranteed that is gonna happen. And in this case, in order for this to work properly, it needs this screw to go into it. But there's nothing in the bottom because if this was a doubled in, we'd be able to get this screw and that would be our two screws. We don't have that, so we need to drill this bracket now to fit a secondary screw down here in the bottom to hold the radio. This is just one of those unforeseen things that happens a lot of the times. If you're looking at dash kits and you see something that looks like this or doesn't come with brackets, be prepared, chances are good, you're gonna run into some kind of a problem. All right, well that looks good. We'll do the same to this bracket and then we'll be back on track. Perfect. 
Now we just need to find some screws to replace the screws that aren't there. Luckily our standard half inch screw that we use will fit. I'm also applying a washer. Make sure if you're doing something like this that the screw that you choose is not too long. You don't want it to poke through the front of the dash kit. That would definitely ruin your day. But because we had to do some modifications to this. I'm gonna take it into the car and just test fit it, make sure all my pieces fit the way they're supposed to. What I'm checking with this back in the dash is these top two screw points to make sure that they line up, and they do. The radio looks good in the dash. All right, looks good. Take it back out, set it on the bench. We can continue on with the installation. The next step in this is mounting the amplifier in place up underneath the driver's seat. This amplifier is almost perfect for this location. Let's take a look. All right, let's take a look at some of the specs for this amplifier we're gonna be putting in. This amplifier is 50 watts by four and 300 by one at four ohms, 75 watts by four and 150 watts by one at two ohms. We're gonna be running this a combination of four ohm and two ohm. We have Dyno, the little brother of this, and we got a ton of power out of it, so we're not worried about how much power this actually puts out. It puts out a ton. Let's take a closer look at the amplifier itself. Starting with the input side, it has your six RCA inputs. A is front, B is rear, and sub. Over on your adjustments, it is broken into your high pass crossover for both A and B. Adjustable between 50 and 200 hertz with an on off switch for both channels. Next up is your sub channel. Adjustable between the same 50 to 200 hertz. Next to that is your bass boost, 0 to 12 dB at 40 hertz. Gain control for all three channels is next. It is 5 to 0 0.2 volts of input. And your sub, we have a switch here for dedicated sub RCA input or a combination of AB to give you non-fader select. On the other side of the amplifier, it has the forked style screw down terminals. Your power remote. For speakers, it goes positive, negative, negative, positive. Left being first, right being second. A on top, B on bottom. Subwoofer are the last two located here. Negative sub is this bottom, positive sub is the top. There's four Allen screws to remove these black pieces so that you can screw it into place and attach your connectors to it. There just so happens to be enough room for the amplifier to sit in this nice little tucked in area. So I've taken some measurements and my plan is to have it go all the way up underneath this bracket here, all the way forward, over, and then up over this air conditioning hump because I need to face the RCAs this way and my power wire will be out the back. Now you won't see most of the power wire because you can't see, but right here it actually comes down about two and a half inches. So you won't have to worry about anybody kicking this. The amplifier is gonna sit well below where the back seat is. My RCAs will come out and go up into the dash. My power wire and everything else will come and go up along here. This side panel shields the whole amplifier, so really you're not even going to know it's there. There's a line in the carpet right here where this sits on, so everything I'm designing will be on the other side of that. This is this giant area that will allow us to get those RCAs up into behind the dash. Fernando seems to think that a six-foot RCA will be long enough, and I agree with him. But I have my measurements. I need a 12 and a quarter by 16 and a half inch sheet in order for this to work. And because it's underneath the seat, I'm gonna use quarter inch, but I could use blown PVC Centra and or ABS. I'm leaning towards the PVC. And I think I see on the saw right there, the perfect shape size. With my mount trimmed down to the size, the 16 and a half by 12 and a quarter, I draw my diagram backwards on it. So this is actually the back. That way when I flip it over, I don't have any of the marks that I've just drawn on it. I'm gonna remove this corner here, this here, this here, there'll be a bend here, and then this will go into the car, we'll figure out where our hole needs to be and we'll drill it in place. Bennett, we just use our torch here, heat it up enough to where it'll bend. I wanna get a nice 90 in here. I can push it all the way down flat with the two cut marks we made. Give it a couple minutes to just cool. If you wanna put a wet rag on it to cool it down faster, go right ahead. This stuff you can typically feel with your finger. If it's squishy, it's not ready. You do have some time when working with this, so if you need to bend something here and then take it into the car, yeah, you can work with it. It does stay pretty hot for a decent amount of time. 
so that gives us that bend there. I need to find out where that is. It measured as one inch, but I'm not positive of that. I'll hop in and just measure it real quick in the car. So I have my mark here. All right, we got it nice and soft. Let's get it into the car and we'll just hold it in place. Now we just wait, give it a couple seconds. If you pull it, as it's cooling like this, you'll get a nice round edge. It won't be as 90, which is what we're doing because the carpet here is kind of rounded. This stuff does stretch a little bit. It's cool to the touch. Set the seat back down in place and I can draw my hole in the back of here. All right, that's the hole I wanna make. And this is the rough. So I'm gonna drill this hole, I'm gonna sand it up a little bit, and I'll meet you guys at the top down camera as we start to wire up this amplifier. When removing little winglets like this, if they're screws, always put them back into the amplifier. That way you don't lose them. Before I get started, I wanna do some pre-check on the amplifier. We need to turn on my high pass crossover just to right around where 80 hertz looks like it's supposed to be for the front and 100 for the rear. Front is the six by nine, it will play a little lower. Do the same for the sub. They don't have to be perfect, they just have to be close in this case. We can make them perfect later. Turn my gains all the way down. Make sure that my sub input switch is set for sub and not A, B. That looks good. This is just a pre-check we do on the amplifier. That way when we're done, connect power to it. If we want to turn it on and listen to it, we know it's a safe thing to do. So the RCAs are gonna come out of the front here and go along this side. My power wire needs to come along here and go up underneath the hood. And my speaker wire is gonna come along this side to meet up with the RCAs to go forward. I have plenty of room underneath here to do what I need to do. This just needs to be big enough to fit speed wire. Speed wire is about the size of a four gauge and I happen to have four gauge right here ready to go. It fits. First step will be to screw the amplifier down into place. There's little tiny nubs on the bottom here. I'm gonna sand those down. Now it's nice and flat. When wiring up an amplifier, I like to take it in segments. Power, output, input, subwoofer wire, base knob, all of those things. And in this case, we are going to start with power, which is located here and has to come along this side of the amplifier. For that, we have some Stinger four gauge power wire. It is already braided up with a fork terminal on the end. If you have the pleasure of doing an amplifier that has screw down terminals like this, whatever you do, do not use a drill to tighten up these wires. That is a big no-no. Use a screwdriver and make sure you get them nice and tight. The next step is to get the wire fastened to our board here and along the side. My first two zip ties in to hold this in place. Next, I need to move it along that. And for that, I'm gonna use my wire ruler. I'm gonna be using the eight inch zip ties, which means I need a five thirty second drill bit. And for this, I wanna get as close as amplifier as possible. On the wire ruler, it has little dash marks next to the holes. So that allows you to line up and use those. So one of the nice things about the wire ruler is because it has those dash marks. As you can see here, we were able to get right up next to that amplifier, not waste any space. I have exactly the amount of room I need, keeps it nice and clean. Next is just getting all those zip ties in place. And there we go, zip tied up nice in place. All the zip ties go in the same direction. If you're gonna do it, be picky about it. This wire comes straight into this area here, which is where it's gonna go off into the car. Next is the RCA. On the tips of the RCAs, I've added some color-coded heat shrink. Green, purple, gray, and white. The Stinger RCAs have this little flag on the end. This is for source unit. They have a drain wire that's twisted into this to move the noise away from the amplifier. That is why they have that on there. And the reason why I'm doing the RCAs next is so that I can get the proper length of my speed wire because it's not gonna be any longer than this. And if I just guess, I could waste a bunch of wire. Doing the RCAs, this allows me to know exactly how long I need it to be. Now these are going to just basically turn along through here. I don't need a zip tie on this, but I am gonna put one here to lock these in place so that they don't accidentally get pulled. 
I'm just putting the RCA in loosely. The reason for that is to line these RCAs up properly, stack them. I need to have a little bit of play room so if I need to pull them out, I can. And then once I have them all flat, pull my zip tie tight. With that done, I need to shield these. I don't want them just chilling out like this up underneath there. None of the factory wiring is like that. I want to make sure mine are the same. Since I've already got them flat, take my Tessa tape and twist it around keeping these nice and tightly stacked on top of one another so that this doesn't get all balled up and twisted around and i'll do that all the way down the rca next up is the speed wire it is a nine conductor wire has all eight speaker wires and this blue remote turn on with the rcas in place and taped up we now know how long this piece of wire needs to be i'm going to fasten it down just past the sub channel here will be where my first zip tie hole is going to be because this sub wire will be over the top of it. Across the bottom is the rear, across the top is the front. I've twisted these in a way that they'll correspond to that. The next step is to cut these all to length and get those in underneath here. It's gonna take a minute to do. I'm also going to add in some more holes to line each one of these up and then get my remote turn on attached down here at the end, which we'll take a look at in a now. And those are all installed, remote turn on wire, everything is zipped up. And that brings us to the last wire, which is our sub wire. This has a nice ferrule finished end to go into the speaker cup and a staggered, just like we were talking about, set of terminals to go on to here. And this is just gonna come out this way. You can use one of the holes that already exists and I will drill two more. Get those zip ties into place. And with that last wire in, I can put on my top here because i'm done screwing wires in i've already put the top on the rca side and that brings this amp board to a conclusion let's take a much closer look at it shall we back of the car front of the car side driver this is going to go down there the ground will probably be located somewhere on this rail system here rca and speed wire are going to go up the center console on this side our sub wire is going to tuck around and go up the back of the car along here but this is it as you can see, it's this side is that two inch gap, but that's it. That's the whole amplifier. This makes it super easy. This is what we call back to front installation, meaning we put all this in and now all we have to do is fish this wire through the car. We don't have to spend that much time in it doing all of this. We can do it here on the bench. It's time to move it into the car, so let's get to it. Now pulling up this carpet here, there's a factory ground bolt located right here, which is perfect. I will have to move and change the end on this, but no big deal. Fernando already drilled a hole in the firewall, which is what I was just running. Now I have some 3M strip caulk to insulate the hole so no water will get through. If you have a bunch of wires to run underneath carpet and stuff like that, don't worry about straightening up the carpet until you get all the wire down where you think it needs to go. If you keep like, I mean, it's okay to like just keep it organized, but you're gonna constantly keep moving it. So wait until the very end and then reorganize, you know, re put the carpet back where it belongs. All right, and after wrangling around in the footwell of this car, the amplifier is all set, ready to go. Ground was attached to the factory ground point that was right there. Car wire came up and around and up into the firewall. The only thing I have left to do is connect these wires, my speed wire and my RCAs, to the back of the radio. But there's the amplifier mounted in place. Now the nice thing is, is that the gain controls are all located right here. So I can fold this seat down and get it all secured if need be. I'm not going to, I'm just gonna fold it down and put it where it needs to. With the amplifier installed, Fernando has tackled 
the fuse holder at the battery. Let's take a look at it. On this one, the battery is located on the passenger side, so our power wire comes up and follows along the main wiring harness and ends up right here. There again, we made a ABS bracket attaches to the factory stem. This will come off if need be, and of course attaches here to the battery. I took the time to attach my speed wire to the speaker wires. And the cool thing about the Alpine is that I can attach my RCAs before I attach it to the radio. And basically what that means is that all my plugs are all set and ready to go to plug into the factory dash bezel with my aftermarket radio on it. I added in my USB adapter. The pack GM USB one doesn't clip into place. There are some that do. So we add heat shrink over it to hold the whole unit together. And that has worked really well for us. And then this will plug into the back of the radio. Fernando took the liberty of running the hands-free mic. It's located up here by the mirror. But yeah, now let's just get this in and we can turn it on and see what it sounds like. Before I get started plugging everything back in, I need my airbag light right here so I can reattach it to the dash kit. There's a lot of plugs that need to get plugged back in. So take your time and go slow. If a plug gets tangled or it isn't run the right direction, make sure to unplug it and redo it so that it makes sense. You want to try to keep this stuff as organized as possible. Looking at all the wire that was coming out of the dash, you can see why I removed that brace. Streamlines the installation so much better. All right, I think I have everything plugged in. Naturally, just go over it. On the aux jacks on the Alpine, make sure you push them in all the way. I don't know what it is about Bluetooth mics on these, but for some reason, we always manage to not push it in all the way. Uh, make sure your air conditioner your hazards all four of those plugs are in everything is good <laughs> snap it into place before we put in these top three screws we'll turn it on all right so carplay popped up good sign it means our usb is connected what's the weather like tonight the forecast is calling for clear skies tonight our push the talk features work on the steering wheel with that working the first before we play it we want to go into our setup Go to sound and check our balance and fader. All right, that is the driver's front, passenger front. That is actually wrong. That is playing the passenger rear. All right, so our back is flipped. Let's test our polarity now. Okay, so we have red there. Let's see what these are doing. All right, we have red there. Good sign. All right, red. All right, red, let's check the rears. Right, I can see the red light flashing, so we have reds. What do you got? Red. So remember, when doing your polarity pops, you're checking to make sure that your speakers are moving in the directions you want them to go in. In this case, all the speakers in this car are going the same direction, so we're good there. We do need to flip the rear, figure out what happened there. And then we can move on to finishing assembly on the dash, and we'll set some gains, and we'll take a listen. But before we do that, let's take a look at the subwoofer. Fernando got the subwoofer in the box. It's sitting down back here behind me. You can see the seat comes down. We ran the wire back. We have plenty of room. It has these two legs, as we showed you, to lift it up above. And that is to clear those two notches. And there is the Comp RT in place. They do make a dual 10 version of this if you guys want a little bit more bass. However, for this, I think we're good. I found the reason why the rears were backwards. The purple and green RCAs were upside down right here. So it's simple, just flip them. And now we have everything set the way we need to. of these but even though it doesn't have a tweeter they play up really really high and honestly I think they're brighter than the six and a halfs in the back like when I was a B in between the two you I, I thought bad. this high frequency that this creates <clears throat> is is more intense than the six and a half in the back 
Which is okay. could be too because the six and a half is really, really low in the low. door. That's part of the problem for sure. Mm -hmm. But these up on the glass are really, really nice. They have a nice bright sound to them. So it right. feels like there is a tweeter. This has right. a really nice sound to it. It's a nice little system that we've put in this truck. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. It's a Nissan Frontier, something a little different. Yeah. That's why we wanted to film it so that you guys could, you know, have some fun and get a little bit other, you know, whatever. Yeah. The other whatever. Whatever, whatever. Ah. All right, guys, Fernando. I'll do the next one, guys. You guys have a great night as always. We'll see you later next time. Thank Bye. you for watching. Bye. Work those steering wheel controls.